preferred thing you want it to be something that's non-invasive yeah. so if i said okay we can measure your biological age but it will involve you know taking some of your skin or something yeah. like, in, like <laughs> but if your liver i don't want to be too bad but it's basically like we'll, we'll um, take your heart out we'll have a look around <laughs> we'll work out how old you are no, but you'll never be any accurate. older than you are now yeah <laughs> but you might not be alive <laughs> What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Would you like to live to be 100 or more in potentially perfect health? What about 200 or 1,000? It's definitely a fascinating question to contemplate, and researchers around the world are attempting to quantify, understand, and reverse the effects and causes of human aging, a debilitating condition that affects each and every one of us. So today we're going to be diving into that fascinating subject of human longevity and seeing if there's anything that we can do to stay a little bit fitter, healthier and younger for longer. And to help us dive into that fascinating topic, we're joined by Eleanor Shiki. So Eleanor, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for taking the time. So Eleanor graduated in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge in 2019 and is now undertaking a PhD at the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute. And she's right at the cutting edge of modern research. She's also got an excellent YouTube channel, which I want to uh, direct you to, the eponymous Shiki Science Show, where she breaks down fascinating and high profile topics in biology such as longevity, biotech, CRISPR, and more. So who better to help us to get into this fascinating topic? So Eleanor, first question, it sounds like a, a very silly question, and maybe it is a stupid question, me not being an expert, but what is aging? What are we, what are we talking about? We can look at someone, we can see someone is old, someone is young, but what are the, the biological markers? What is aging? I mean, firstly, that isn't a silly question. That's actually a really good question. <laughs> Thank you, Eleanor. I, pre I, appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. Um, and I, I guess it's actually a really important question to ask. And I think you can give different answers depending on basically your understanding of what aging is. And so I guess, yeah, the first thing as you kind of alluded to is the idea that aging to some extent is just describing the process of getting older. It's something that happens to us um, as we spend each additional year on this planet. And that's characterized by different phenotypes. And it's also a major risk factor for a variety of different diseases, um, such as cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, cancer risk. And so you can see it from that perspective mm. as just some kind of process of getting older. Yeah. Um, but then I suppose probably something that you might be hinting at is a different idea, which is more like what is the biological underpinning mm. of this aging process? And um, in that regard, um, studies have shown that aging could be considered more of a malleable process, something that isn't just a linear increase in time. It's something that could be um, slowed down, increased in speed, and mm. you can kind of play about with it. And so understanding the biological aspects and the different signaling pathways or different processes that might be involved in regulating what is whatever aging is as a collective uh, kind of phenotype is kind of the more interesting questions to ask um, and something that's yeah being heavily researched so there's a there's a essentially I, I guess what you're saying there if I if I might summarize it is there's a difference potentially between sort of chronological age where we say that person's 50 that person's 70 and maybe biological age so someone who I don't know drinks all the time might have a liver that's like a 50 year old for example is that is that kind of what we're what we're saying there that there's a difference between biological age and some of those biological markers and, and, and the chronological time you've spent alive, essentially? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, everyone's got a chronological age that's just going to increase over time. But it's um, what we would refer to as biological age. Um, that is something that could be, you know, fluctuates and, and doesn't have to um, be, a, it wouldn't necessarily equate to our chronological age. Um and so that alludes on to, well, how do you, like, I guess, measure? Uh, that, that was going to be the next question because <laughs> I, I've, I've seen some of these nice plots in a, there's a talk by David Sinclair I looked at. He's got a nice plot of chronological age against biological age for a couple of mice and there's two different lines. So it, it seems like there's some ways that we might potentially quantify this. Maybe if you could tell us a little bit about that. 
Sure. Yeah. So this is actually a really exciting area of study at the moment. And there isn't just one way we think we could do this. There's like multiple ways we think we can do this. And so the kind of premise of being able to measure biological age firstly depends on having a biomarker or a set of biomarkers mm. that would actually reflect what biological age is. Mm. And so there's actually, I'm probably going to get them, not all of them included, but there's actually like a criteria of like so-called um, a list of criteria that would define what a good biomarker of aging actually is. So the first thing um, that you want your biomarker to be is ideally a kind of better predictor of your age than mm. chronological age. Mm. So something that's kind of underpinning this biological age process. So is um, that so is that like, like if we if we took a random person and we looked at that marker uh, and we took a, a, a large range of people, we'd have a a decent ability to predict. Ah, that's probably come from an old man, and that's come from a young woman, and is, is that sort of what you what you're saying with with a biomarker of aging? Exactly, yeah. Um, and then the idea that the reason we want it to be a better predictor than like chronological age is that, as I said at the beginning, age is like a, a risk factor for these yeah, different diseases. Yeah, yeah. So if you've got a higher biological age, then it's like, okay, you might be at more risk mm. for this disease. Can we do something about it? Yeah. Um, so that's one of the key like um, criteria of a good aging biomarker. Mm. And something else um, that as well would be a good biomarker of biological age would be something that underpins the aging process and helps us to understand what actually yep. is regulating aging yep. so that's the kind of challenging uh, uh criteria at the moment to fulfill um and then the second thing well not, not the second thing the third thing you want it to be something that's non-invasive yep. so if i said okay we can measure your biological age but it will involve you know taking some of your skin or something <laughs> yeah. like, in, like but if you'll ever i think it wouldn't be too bad but it's basically like we'll, um, we'll take your heart out we'll have a look around <laughs> we'll work out how old you are no. but you'll Give never be any accurate. older than you are now yeah <laughs> but you might not be alive yeah, but yeah, yeah um so yeah that's obviously very important something that's non-invasive yeah. something that maybe could be um measured very frequently like mm. um and also something that's probably quite cost effective, easy to measure. So things like that would be very important. And then the last criteria, I think, is um, at the moment, because before going into human studies, we study things in model organisms. Mm. So mice, yep. yeast, uh, Drosophila, like fruit flies. Yep. Um, and so it would be good for it also to work in those model uh, organisms yeah, yeah. so that we can test different interventions first yep. and then go, OK, OK, this works here it looks like it's going to be safe we can then extrapolate this to human studies so that's like a kind of criteria i mean i might be a bit boring but that's kind of like a good groundwork of like what are these potential biomarkers going to be yeah that's that sounds very so, sensible what what would be a couple of examples so i've, I've seen things well while, while i've been doing my sort of you know hacky google research things like telomere length or dna <laughs> methylation and things like this are there are there certain sort of clocks that that people tend to try and use to to get, get a handle on biological age exactly yeah so this is we yeah, are coming on to so what are these biomarkers and so um i guess kind of more of a historical um or maybe even the first kind of official clock was the use of telomeres which mm. is the idea that every time a cell divides um okay so maybe i should backtrack a little bit telomeres um are found at the ends of mm. dna yeah um they're kind of they get wrapped up in a kind of complex and they kind of protect the ends of DNA from being recognized as like double stranded breaks and maybe a little bit TMI, but effectively it keeps your DNA stable. Yeah. But what happens is every time a cell divides due to the way that replication occurs of DNA, they, they shorten a little bit. And so over time they get a bit shorter and so the cells more at risk of um, unraveling, so to speak. Yeah. But um, so that measuring telomere length could in theory show you how many times that cell replicated mm. how much potential has it got left to need to replicate but um actually like since those early studies and like more like cell culture so when you just grow cells con continuously in a plate not like in a body mm. it's possibly not a good way okay. of measuring in a body purely for the fact that not all of our cells are replicating yeah like for example in our brain like all of our ne neuron cells are just always been there and so it's just no not necessarily the best way mm. to to measure it and so actually um since then other approaches as you've mentioned dna methylation um, is something that's kind of a hot topic at the moment mm. and so that refers to a kind of epigenetic modification that's added to dna um have i lost you, <laughs> Are you no 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 so so <laughs> so just to so to give a little bit of background so the the dna sort of gets covered in these these ch4 you know methane methyl groups 
over time. Um, and and this epigenetics, if you could if you could just explain that for a bit. So, so epigenetics is sort of sits above genetics, right? And it's how the how the cell sort of references the DNA to do certain things to make a protein. It's sort of the the framework of how the DNA is used. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah. So the other way of thinking of it is like um, the DNA contains like the genetic information, mm. but it's um, the epigenetics is like how that information should be read. Yeah. Um, so like the other analogy is always like if you've got a piece of music and a composer, like yeah. you've got the music which dictates how what's exactly being played, but yeah. then the composer can regulate how loud or how quiet or how yeah. fast it should be. Yeah. Um, and so there's all sorts of different types of epigenetic marks that you can find within um, the nucleus. So there's proteins that um, are used to compact DNA. Because I mean, there's so much DNA and it's squished up yeah. into a tiny little space. And so the proteins that help to mediate that compaction can get modified. But the the modification that's used so far in these um, epigenetic clocks are um, modifications of DNA itself. So yeah, DNA can get methylated. And so that can influence how the DNA is packaged within a nucleus. And depending on whether it's really compact or quite open, it depends on how different genes are being expressed, also influences um, DNA repair. Um, and like, um, yeah, so it's not just necessarily gene expression, but it's also just how that DNA is kept tight. And so um, another good way of thinking about it is like, we've got different, we have the same DNA in all of our cells, but like our skin cell is different to our neuron cell or our liver cell, like yeah. they're doing different things. That's all down to its epigenetic yeah. marks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that the idea is that um, during aging, some of these methylation marks appear to change. Hmm. And so what you can do is you can basically read out the, the sites and see if they're methylated or not. Hmm. And then using a composition of these different sites, you can um, basically predict what someone's biological age might be. Hmm. That's really cool. And it seems, at least in some of these these early studies, it seems like you can get quite a nice linear sort of, well, linear um, linear fit, if you will, between biological age and, and chronological age. So you can get that sort of, it works relatively well as a biological clock, so to speak, um, using those those biomarkers. So that's that's really, really cool. Um, so, so you sort of touched on something there. It seems that different parts of the body can have different ages. Is that is that fair to say, different biological ages? So, yeah, that's an inter interesting question. So, um, actually, yeah, I based on what we currently seem to think is, like, our body doesn't all age at the same rate. Like, mm. one tissue might age faster than other tissues. Mm. And, like, maybe my liver might age faster than yours, but mm. maybe your... Uh, I know your tr tr trust trust me, my than liver than is aging <laughs> faster than yours. Trust Trust me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the idea is like, it might depend on the individual itself, yeah. um, and other genetic factors that might underpin it. And so they're so called like AGO types, which are basically, uh, the idea that, um, the rates of aging may differ in different people mm. and in different ways. And at the moment, it, I can't really, it sounds a bit wishy-washy as I'm saying it, but, um, we haven't really got the data to kind of, um, like there isn't enough data mm. to really understand why that might be the case or how exactly it might be happening at the moment but i yeah i would definitely say that based on what we currently know it would seem like our tissues probably age at different rates mm. and then that could be interesting for like down the stream interventions because um if you as if your one tissue is aging faster than another it might be you need this not that kind of thing yeah and then the other interesting thing is um going back to these um biological aging clocks is a lot of them at the moment are using uh blood as like a source of mm being able to 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 detect um or to measure the age and yeah. so i only mentioned epigenetic age but there's also potential for like looking at metabolites in the blood mm. also looking at gene expression mm. patterns and also looking at proteomics so looking at what proteins are in the blood yeah and so obviously the blood is like kind of systemic right um so then the interesting question is is it representing a kind of systemic age or yeah. is it picking up a specific tissue and that, yeah. again that's a question we don't know the answer to yeah, because it, because obviously it goes around all the different tissues picking up various things, and so it's uh, so you can't be sure exactly where everything's coming from. Yeah, exactly. Good. So, so how you you sort of touched on very briefly talking about sort of animal model, models and and Drosophila and 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 yeast and and mice. We do these these studies of aging. 
How does human aging compare to that of other species, potentially other species where we might get um, some confidence that we could extend our age? So I'm thinking about, you know, there's, there's creatures like, like Greenland sharks, like, you know, Galapagos tur turtles, tortoises who live for hundreds of years. People are always going on about the naked mole rat in this in this sort of arena of research that doesn't seem to age. How, how does human aging compare with with other uh, animals in the animal kingdom? Sure. So, I mean, that's honestly a really interesting and good question to ask because, I mean, I think obviously being human is often quite human, <clears throat> human centric and yeah, about course, ourselves, yeah. but actually there's so much fascinating biology out there. Mm. I mean, you have to watch like David Attenborough to know that. Um, but yeah, you're right. Like the, the Nick and Morats are super fascinating. And so, um, like a lot of research is being done and to understand them because they seem to be quite cancer resistant. Mm. Um, and part of this is due to the fact that they have a kind of, obviously their genetics is different. Um, and so um, the way they express genes is different um, in terms of like their expression patterns. Mm. And they also have uh, differences in their genetic layout. So they have like proteins that get expressed that you wouldn't necessarily find in humans. Um, and so depicting exactly what it is um, that enables them to, to do that could be potentially useful for understanding mm. why they might show these benefits. Um, obviously, you could also bear in mind their environmental conditions are very different yeah. to our own. Yeah. Um, so that also comes into it as well. And so I guess um, it's, a, it's good to, to study these small organisms to find out insights, but then how it then translates back to humans is always going to be a challenging problem because even in mice where majority of studies are done at the moment, that's such a huge problem in translatability from yeah. mouse studies to humans. Yeah. And so obviously there is a lot of overlap between the pathways and stuff, but there's also so many differences in humans that we're still trying to uncover. I mean, it's kind of crazy when you think about it, that like uh, and like 5% difference in the genome can manifest in such yeah. Yeah. huge differences. So, um, so it but, could be useful to look at these animals, but then again, they're, they're so different to us. They... They evolved in, in different niches. They they have such different genetics. Even that small change, as you say, 5% is absolutely huge in, in the way a naked mole rat we look like, uh, for example, that potentially looking at them might be able to give us some hints, maybe some interesting pathways, some ideas for research. But being able to translate that over could be could be incredibly difficult. Exactly, yeah. Um, and then... Like, as you mentioned, the Greenland sharks is another interesting example. Mm. Um, but I guess the other thing with some, so there's some really interesting model organisms, but the challenge is how to study them. Because obviously, like, the thing with, the reason why so much is done in mice and, like, flies and mm. stuff is because we have very good procedures in place to, yeah. like, like mass produce them, so to speak, um, and to um, be able to easily, uh, they have short lifespans, so, again, you can feasibly do a PhD project. <laughs> Whereas, I mean, could you imagine trying to do, you know, Greenland shark, the PhD project on that? Like, <laughs> you'd never finish it, right? Yeah. Um, so that's, I guess, another thing to bear in mind with like aging research, especially is like, you know, you need a lifetime to measure it, right? Yeah. Um, so that's why uh, certain model organisms are really good to use, which is why I like yeast as well, it's mm. used a lot. Um, but then, yeah, you have the problem of, okay, now we find something that, can it also be reflected in human aging? So to be able to do the research, we really need to find out how to sort of wind that clock forward and backwards, right? And then we can do the research in real time. But we obviously can't do that at the moment because we don't know we don't know how to do it. And as you say, that means that, you know, doing it on a human takes 70 years or whatever, because that's how long we, we take to live. And you'd have to have a, a load of people in your in your research um, set up to be able to do that. What What is the the latest or the, or the most sort of cutting edge idea as to as to why we age so we talk we've talked about those sort of hallmarks of aging you know we start to essentially fall apart things get more difficult in the body uh things start to unravel what is the leading theory as to sort of why we age and and, and tend to sort of sort of seem to fall off a cliff people think after 40 years of age or so um so i mean again i would say there are some like I there's not just one leading theory. Mm. I think it's still being heavily like debated mm. and discussed in the community. Yeah. Um, but besides like the hallmarks of aging, which kind of give a good overview, there's also like, I guess, aspects to the hallmarks that aren't that we should probably include as other things that um haven't been investigated as much. Mm. Um, but one thing to just mention first is like as we spoke about epigenetics, one kind of theory of aging mm. um 
is the information theory mm. of aging that as we as we age is kind of like a loss of information it's the loss of that skin cell to remember it's a skin cell um the loss of the neuron to think it's still a neuron yeah. um and the kind of unraveling of the, of the chromatin and changes in these epitheticic marks that might um yeah be contributing to this loss of information and so that can then i guess propagate out to the gene expression mm. to proteins which fundamentally perform what goes on in the cell and so yeah that's one kind of leading idea that can we restore this information and how would we be able to do that mm. um and then i guess another thing that I think was kind of somewhat overlooked in the hallmarks is um the more like ideas about the is aging kind of contagious mm. um which <laughs> i made a video on this which was quite funny because i wasn't meaning like contagious contagious i mean like within the body contagious yeah. um <laughs> two other systems um, and other organs and this kind of thing rather than rather than an old person walks past you and suddenly you're si you're 60 <laughs> years old Exactly. Um, well, there was like a film that came out, um, I think, recently about some called Old. Oh, sorry, yeah, I, I think that was it. a, a like mid Midnight film. Shyamalan one or something. They're all on the mm. beach, isn't it? Yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. It looked quite interesting, though. Um, but obviously, that's not I, I haven't seen the film, so I can't comment yeah. on how accurate that is. Um, but um, yeah, the other thing as I was kind of going on to was the kind of systemic fact that um, there's a lot of communication within our body, whether it's neuronal signaling or chemical signaling. And one interesting thing that I find quite fascinating at the moment is the gut microbiome. Um, so all the different bacteria, uh, fungi and viruses that kind of inhabit our gut. And they're not just like, you know, chilling about in our bodies. Um, they're actually performing really important roles, mm. whether it's like digesting foods, um, helping with nutrient absorption but they also themselves produce different like metabolites mm. like they produce serotonin for example um and i mean that's just one example they produce like hundreds of different things and we're still trying to really investigate what it is they do but obviously these can then travel about the body <clears throat> and you know pass the the blood brain barrier and so could also have influences on mm. brain aging um and so i think um there's some very interesting work in trying to uh I guess, uh, depict what's exactly going on with these signaling pathways mm. within and between tissues. Um, as there was on another study that came out last year, um, that basically in mice, there's something called neutral blood exchange. So what they did is they take a, quite a large proportion of the, the, the blood from the mice. And what they do is they take out the plasma and they replace it with like, I guess like, buffered salt controlled um plasma back in so basically they've taken out potentially a load of inflammatory factors yeah. and other proteins that might be circulating around the body and what happens is these mice seem to show um rejuvenation in different tissues mm. and so that could be a very kind of um like obviously it's somewhat invasive but also kind of non-invasive yeah. way that has numerous benefits on different tissues um, but also maybe signals and hints at the idea that maybe aging is this kind of like contagious process that maybe just has to have like some kind of dysfunction in one tissue and that kind of just uh, you're building up a load of junk and, and and stuff that becomes debilitating or, or poisonous quote unquote to to other tissues potentially yeah but i mean i, I sort of think i mean again i'd still say that doesn't fully answer the question because then what's happening in that first yeah. you know subset that's causing them to age and cause all these problems um, so yeah, I think it's still something that's heavily debated. Um, I think it's just like, so yeah, um, the good example is like to compare aging into like cancer where we know cancer is a genetic disease caused by mutations. And so that's really helped us to advance in, uh, cancer therapeutics. Mm. And so it's a really important question to ask because if we can have a really good framework for like what aging is, it then makes it way easier to then be like, okay, we can target this, target that. Yeah. Um. So it's it's a good thing to kind of to discuss. Um. But yeah, I don't think we're we're not there yet. We're not quite there I, yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really interesting because I I was chatting to 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 Yuri Dane last last week about this topic as well, and um, he was saying exactly the same that we're not really there, but this this idea that the the epigenetic sort of breakdown over time was was one of these leading theories this information theory of aging and he and he pointed to this um i'm sure you've seen it this this study where they managed to um essentially partially regrow 
the um, the cells of a mouse's optic nerve. So they they go in, they pinch the optic nerve, kill it essentially, um, and then they were they were able to deliver some of these um, what are they Yamanaka factors to essentially be able to do a sort of soft reset of the cell, if you will, make it go back to just after it was a stem cell and be able to differentiate again. <clears throat> so is the idea that that the cell can sort of is it, I don't know if resets the right word, but but you can make it go back to thinking it's young and and re go back through that cycle again, and and essentially have it go through that cycle from being young to old, young to old, young to old. It's a it's a series of soft resets that might be able to extend our our lifespan. Is that is that what what's going on in that kind of research? Yes, yeah, so, I mean I think you're right. I think like resetting is probably the right word to use, and I mean. We'll come back to that example in a second, but I think a good way to think about it is how, um, like, obviously we say that we're aging, but I could have a, a child, right? And then that mm. child's not going to be born really old unless it's <laughs> Benjamin Button. But, um, <laughs> like, there seems to be a very fascinating process that goes on between, like, the, I guess, post fertilization and then, like, there seems to be a whole kind of de-aging process that must be occurring there to, yeah. to create um you know the embryo that's mm. um never really kind of effectively that, starts like a they, so there's an interesting review article that i kind of summarized in a paper earlier this year a video even um about this idea about ground zero so like at some point your biological age must be at its lowest point right and then from there on as you know it's mm. more downhill but technically yeah. uphill because it increases <laughs> yeah. but um so so clearly there is some kind of program or maybe some set of factors that already seems to be involved in mm. like wiping the slate the slate clean mm. and starting fresh um and and so the idea is, is that maybe some of these factors could be these yamanaka factors right mm. so uh these yamanaka factors are transcription factors um and so they can basically alter uh, to some extent that the the profile of genes that are being expressed mm. in a cell um and the yamanaka factors are found highly expressed in stem cells or like mm. early embryonic cells and so that kind of makes sense. So that kind of makes sense why adding them to adult cells could have this mm. rejuvenative effect um, in the um, the optic nerve that they saw in the study. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of like one of the, the ideas. And then the other case is like, um, another demonstration of this is like Dolly the sheep. Yeah. Is it Dolly? I've... Yeah, <laughs> yeah Dolly, this, Dolly was the clone sheep, wasn't it? It was, it was quite a while ago now. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's the same kind of principle where you can take the nucleus out of an adult cell, yeah. put it into an empty oocyte, and then there seems to be factors in that oocyte that seem to be able to, you know, clear away the marks and produce, like, well, Dolly. Um, so, yeah, so there's some very interesting biology going on, and that definitely could be one way that we can try to understand how, you know, we are able to go back to this grand theory every mm. time there's, like, um, yeah, newborn so i think that's yeah it's definitely something that's quite interesting so so it, it, that raises a really sort of in some ways well interesting question and and, and that, in another ways a little bit of a very dark question as to why does the body not do this already so why hasn't and this, again, might sound like a very stupid question. Again, I'm a physicist, not a biologist. But why has evolution not gotten rid of ageing? It seems sensible that if we want to pass on our genes, just staying alive would, would you know, keep our genes there. Why is why has evolution not got rid of ageing? Is it just that the genes really don't care that, that we fall apart after we've had a child? Is is that sort of the idea that's that's going on here? Yeah, so I mean, there's multiple theories, like evolutionary theories for aging, like one of them being like antagonistic pleiotropy, that like something that's good for us in terms of getting good growth um, when we're young, then becomes deleterious, uh, like post-reproductive okay. age. Yeah. Um, so, and then, I mean, evolution is messy, is like a phrase that's thrown about, like, if you actually look um, at some of the ways like our organs have built and developed, I always, I think there's, I don't know which organism it is, but there's some example about like the way the fallopian tube is wrapped around in some organism. I can't quite remember. Oh, like, there's, there's the one, I remember the one in the giraffe where the nerve goes all the way, it has to go like Pom uh, an inch yeah. and it goes all the way down the neck, around, wraps around the heart and comes back up. 
I can't remember which nerve it is, but it's it's Dawkins go to for evolution over intelligent design because it's it's so absurd as to why why that would happen. Yeah, but that's I mean that's just a really good example. Mm. Like I mean aging could be exactly the same thing, right? Like yeah. we just evolved to survive in the moment. Like we mm. I don't know, I mean obviously we being with intelligence can think about future states, but when yeah. you're there in, in the moment and you've got food and you want to just keep going, then, then it makes sense to just do it, right? And mm. so yeah, evolution works in weird and wonderful ways. Um so maybe it's just a consequence of that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So I might be just falling into the trap of thinking that evolution is an optimized system when it when it clearly isn't it's just the, the, there to survive in the moment i think there's there's two major major theories that i looked at the one that the one that you mentioned which was you know the kind of selective pressures they weaken after the reproductive age you get this antagonist ag- antagonistic pleistropy that you that you talked about so essentially the the body doesn't care after you've pumped out your babies and then there was there was the the minority view that sort of yuri was going on about last week that was that we have a sort of coded program, if you will, and the genes sort of picking up research uh, resources, and the species is fitter if it simply gets rid of us. Which was, I found a little bit more of a, you know, a related theory, but I found that even a little bit, bit even darker than the than the initial one. That essentially, after we've passed on our genes, we've done our job as a photocopier. We're, we're not much use anymore. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have too much to add to that. Um, like, I think it's, it's fun to kind of consider these ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, one thing that made me think of um, when we spoke about, like, the Yamanaka factors was the uh, the idea that although we don't seem to live forever, there are certain species that do seem to be so-called mm-hmm. immortal, yeah. which are, like, negligible senescence. Yeah. And then the other interesting example is, uh, like, salamanders um, and planarians, I believe, where they show, like, rejuvenation of tissues so like if you cut off limbs they grow yeah, back yeah and it's like well, okay clearly some organisms have retained this potential can we understand the uh the biochemical underpinning of what happens during these these stages and be able to exploit it yeah um so so we potentially have those those building blocks those mechanisms to be able to do it it's just evolution yeah evolution didn't need to do it at that time so so do we have the pieces i i remember when i was when i was research researching this and and chatting to a couple of people i was i was quite negative on it because it it felt to me kind of like you're taking a car and trying to make it be a washing machine or you're taking a car and trying to make it be a hairdryer is is it fair you know you can you could dry your hair on a car you put your head next to the engine and you know it would dry your hair and blah 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 but it wasn't designed to do that it didn't go through those selective pressures to be to be able to do that is it is it fair to say and maybe maybe I'm going a little bit too far but is it is it fair to say that as we as we try to aim for a longer lifespan greater human longevity that what we're trying to do is essentially unpick those pathways that evolution went down and and try to use the pieces that we've got to to aim at a different function, staying younger for longer or staying healthier for longer, rather than just getting to twenty, pumping out a kid, and then that's it. Is, is are we are we fighting evolution when we're looking at these longevity studies? Sure, I think you asked a, a, maybe like a, several questions. <laughs> yeah, that. That was, um, uh, I was in the so I was I, in the zone. Um. So, so what I think I understood you were saying was like, um, the first thing I understood was, are there actually any concerns to doing such a procedure because it's kind of going against our design? And so I think for certain, like, especially with um, this rejuvenation is we have to be careful that we don't kind of go too far back. Mm. And so, and cause things so called like teratomas. Yeah, so yeah. obviously you can go back and then you want to like re-differentiate into cells and you don't want it to kind of go back and do something different yeah. because then that could be very deleterious. Yeah. And then there's the fact that these stem cells, these like very um, young- So you can't things, you can't just go back to a big blob of stem cells because you essentially just make a, a huge cancerous tumor, a teratoma, that's, that's no good. Exactly. And like, that's one of the, I guess, major concerns mm. with these approaches at the moment. Mm. And like, have like another thing that's important to stress is like, the studies we have so far, like if anything, but done in mice, which is the closest mm. to us really, like there really isn't any human data to support. And we have literally no idea what the potential could be. 
um, obviously like the first uses would be to try and treat those who have limb dysfunction or like mm. in terms of like absolute needs um, that should definitely be considered first. Yeah. Um, so I honestly have no idea what kind of potential uses that there, there could be for it. Um, but it's just, it's, yeah, it's important to consider the kind of uh, consequences of what this might do because it's something that might be, as you say, fighting against what our system is built to yeah. cope with. And if you mess with one thing, it could have a knock-on effect in another area that you're not necessarily um, wanting to touch. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So you have to be very careful. Um, so I guess that, that brings us on to some of the research that's going on at the moment. So how can we determine the kind of gene expressions, the pathways, the molecules that potentially have a significant impact on longevity and, and examine possible interventions? How How is that research being done and, and what, are the, what are the most interesting findings at the moment? Yeah, so um, the kind of idea that we understood that aging is this kind of malleable process has mainly been built upon all of the hundreds of like studies that have been done in model organisms. Mm. So the very early studies were done in like things like worms, and yeast and what happens was is they found that the, the some of these um these yeast and worms were living you know up to double their mm. lifespan compared to to others because they just had a mutation in specific genes yeah. and so a lot of the early work uncovered um different genes that all turned out to be kind of in a, the same signaling pathway mm. and i mean sometimes the signaling pathway is referred to as the longevity signaling pathways but it's just the kind of like growth signaling pathway that goes on um, in our cells. So, you know, if you eat food, you increase like um, the nutrients in our body, that increases like growth hormone to be secreted. And this binds to a receptor on the outside of the cell. Then that signals in, activates a protein. This protein activates other proteins, might inhibit other proteins. It all kind of, you know, signals its way down to um, the genome where um, factors, transcription factors get activated and they can regulate the expression of different genes. Mm. And so what was happening in these different uh, model organisms is like when they had a disruption in that gene, the protein became defective. Mm. And so it reduced sig signaling through this pathway. And if it was growth signaling, it seemed to reduce growth and um, by reducing growth um, seemed to kind of instead activate more like um, self-repair mechanisms that it enabled them to live longer. That's kind of like a wishy washy kind of explanation of what mm. we uncovered, but yeah. So so in order to look at a particular uh, intervention or a particular molecule or isolate a particular pathway, I guess we'd, we'd have to take a cohort of, of some mice or whatever model organism we're using that do have some particular change in, in gene expression that we that we engineer or we give them a particular substance or whatever it might be and a cohort that don't and we and we just do a control study like like we would with the um how long these mice live or how long these yeast cells live is that is that sort of the the way that this development of potential um interventions and finding these pathways goes Exactly. I mean, and so I guess, yeah, one of the, the challenges in the field is like, as you say, how exactly you do these studies, mm. it's going to differ depending on whereabouts you are, like what resources you have, what kind of mm. mouse strains you have. Yeah. And so one of the issues that's happened at the moment is the fact that one study might say, OK, this mm. intervention extended their lifespan, but someone might try and repeat it and they don't get the same results. Yeah. And so actually one thing that's tried to kind of resolve all these issues at the moment is the interventions testing program, ITP, which is um, funded by the National Institute of Aging, okay. um, which is the NIH. And so what they're doing is they basically have loads of mice that um, have um, a bit of heterogeneity within them. So they're not all genetically identical, yeah. but they have the original parent, so they can yeah. kind of reproduce this heterogeneity. And so um, they also test these interventions, not just at one site, but they reproduce it mm. in three different sites. And so that can kind of uh, counts for maybe like maybe slightly environmental or like some, even the person doing the, the like manipulation of the yeah. mice yeah. might also influence it. Like yeah. when I do studies in the lab, it has to be me 
to get reproduced for ourselves yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. it might just have maybe i'm i'm the person maybe it's not <laughs> what i'm doing for ourselves me yeah. um i mean that would be bad but yeah i mean so you have to kind of control for these factors yeah, yeah. um and yeah as i said they got loads of these mice to, to give them power for numbers and so they they're trying to resolve the issue that um some things might just be strain specific so can we eliminate certain interventions by doing this larger scale approach mm. to really work out what is actually extending lifespan in mice yeah because it's, it's really difficult to into, on, on disentangle isn't it like you said it could be a different strain of mice that the mice could have lived uh, in a different way they had a different environment they ate more food or whatever it might have been it's so difficult to disentangle all these uh, environmental and genetic factors and if you start off with quote unquote different model organisms at the start different mice you're on a bit of a hiding to nothing so it seems like getting that baseline as 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 stable as possible is a very important way forward what what are the the sort of gene expressions the pathways that that, that people think are most important in in longevity at the moment from those model organism studies and how do they how do they operate sure um so yeah, okay, so to give an example, so one of the kind of identified compounds from this ITP study that extended uh, lifespan in both male and female mice, that's something I should have mentioned as well. They did it in both sexes. So other mm. studies might just do it in male mice, it's yeah, quite common. Yeah. Um, so it's good that they do it in female mice as well. Um, and in fact, some of these interventions show sex specific um, yeah. performance. Um, so rapamycin, I don't know if I so, yeah, so rapamycin is one that extended lifespan in both male and female mice. Mm. <clears throat> and so rapamycin inhibits um, a protein called mTOR, yeah. which actually stands for uh, the mammalian target of rapamycin. So it was kind of named after this compound. So they, so they, they didn't inhibits... push the boat out too much in the naming, but, <laughs> but it's it sounds, mTOR sounds, sounds better. Yeah, I, I see. Um, and so mTOR is in this um, growth signaling pathway that I was describing earlier. Um, and so that, that kind of, um, so it, yeah, so it kind of makes sense when we think back to all the original studies where we see genes getting mutated that inhibit this pathway, if you can inhibit it with this compound instead, it can maybe show the same effects whereby you see enhancement in their lifespan. So, 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 so what does that, what does that mTOR specifically do in the body? And so this, this, this rapamycin sort of down regulates it doesn't it this this expression of this it's a sort of nutrient sensor is it this tor um that, yeah. how does it how does it sort of operate in the body and why why do we think that that helps these worms or these or these mice to to live longer well i'm laughing because mTOR is like literally like there's so many papers on it being involved in like so many different processes so <laughs> i'm not, <laughs> i don't think we so we're not we're not fully but... we're not we're not fully sure but like one so one key thing that i like one thing I'm confident in that we think mTOR is doing, so it basically it phosphorylates other proteins. Um, mm. And some of the proteins that phosphorylate um, are proteins involved in the regulation of translation. So translation is a process within the body where you have mRNA. So I, I always feel like I lose people. So mRNA um, is like the transcript that's come from reading your DNA sequence. Yeah. So it's just... Um, I always think of it as like a... Is, is it and tell me if i'm saying something stupid isn't uh, mrna is like it's like a photocopy of the of the dna right that then gets you used to make the protein is that is that correct so it's like it's, a, it's an rna photocopy yeah. so it's not a, yeah i hope we can give a photocopy mm -hmm. um so dna in the cell if you you have genes in your dna a process called transcription mm. converts that dna into rna the yeah. rna is much smaller and it's only a section of dna so mm. it can escape the nucleus effectively mm go into the cytoplasm of the cell. And when it's in the cytoplasm, it then gets bound by this big, really big complex called the ribosome. Yeah. And the ribosome does this process of translation. So it reads the RNA sequence and generates a protein. So um, mTOR is involved in regulating this process of mm. translation. And so um, by inhibiting mTOR, it seems to reduce global translation within a cell so it actually reduces the amount of proteins and so also you need more proteins to grow to replicate so the idea is like by inhibiting this process you're reducing cell growth right is that potentially have ill effects though as well sure um <clears throat> so 
obviously you don't want to maybe do this all the time like we still need to sell grave and stuff yeah, yeah. um and i mean at the moment so the reason why um rapamycin was is rapamycin's already being used like in a clinic like it's mm. used as like an immunosuppressant but there could be side effects like i believe in the mice studies they did see maybe at high doses there's like testicular degeneration and even like cataracts mm. they see so I, I think yeah the concerns are like the could be off target effects like yeah mTOR isn't as I said it's not just involved in regulating translation it yeah. might interfere in other processes as well um this increasingly seems to be involved in lots of things so I guess this is yeah, the evolution I, coming back around again that we've got all these systems that are doing one thing or maybe 10 things and then they interact with this and this and this and this and this and then just trying to target one thing is very very difficult when you're going into that sort of deeply entangled system it's extremely difficult to 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 only hit that one pathway or 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 whatever whatever target gene expression you're going for without having a knock-on effect on other systems exactly i mean because i mean evolution I know we said it is kind of messy, but in other ways, it's kind of evolved to be quite efficient. If mm. it's got a pathway, it wants to just co-opt it and use it for mm. something slightly different. And mm. so it's it's quite you know it's you know it's quite sa savvy, it's quite efficient. But then it's got this problem that one protein might be involved in hundreds of different things. Yeah. And so yeah. yeah, then it becomes quite complicated. So we should be careful if you're if you're going to take any of these compounds. We're not suggesting today that you that that, that you take anything, but these are some of the at least one compound that people are interested in. I know some people do do take courses of, of rapamycin with with some idea that they might enhance their their longevity. There's a couple of others as well that people talk about. I just just wanted to mention them quickly. People talk about metformin and and resveratrol. Is there is there anything in, in those that that is useful? So out of the yeah, so as the two just mentioned, I would say metformin definitely is looking a lot more promising. So there's also, I mean, it's kind of been in the works for a while now, but there's something, the first anti-aging clinical trial, and so this is actually now trying to evaluate its effect, if, um, efficacy in humans, um, is the targeting aging with metformin trial. Hmm. So um, metformin, again, is like rapamycin, it's been used in medical treatments and this time for type 2 diabetes mm. but there's the very interesting finding based on um obviously um, a, a human trial where they found that di diabetics who are given metformin had a better survival rate than aged matched controls who weren't diabetics mm. so it's like not only did the metformin you know improve uh, their type 2 diabetes which that is in itself is kind of like an aging associated mm. disease but it also like made them better than the controls that didn't have diabetes. Mm. And so that kind of hints at like it might have a benefits beyond just being a kind of glucose control drug. Um, and so, I mean, my, my concerns of metformin is like, I, I didn't really still really understand what it's targeting mm. within the body. Um, I think they said it, it does... activates this M, uh, AMPK, AMPK. Yeah. And then and then inhibits mTOR, so it, it goes sort of the rapamycin route again, I guess, in in, in some sense. Um, and then, as you say, that there's this. I don't know if this was the trial you were talking about. This plant is it? Is it tame? Tame, yeah. yeah. Where they're gonna where they're gonna look more into that. That that actually what you said raises a really interesting question regarding this longevity research. So, what what do you classify? And maybe maybe this is just semantics and it's not particularly important but what goes in as longevity research or a longevity intervention so you could say you know uh, people washing their hands or having soap or having access to clean water is a longevity intervention because that helps us to live longer with less disease um, but but there's no sort of genetic pathway intervention there um, are we saying here with metformin maybe there's an intervention that you don't die from diabetes because it has the effect that it's supposed to have on that disease, but also maybe there's some deeper genetic pathway intervention that might be going on, which requires more research. Is that sort of the delineation between a kind of environmental impact longevity increase and a more of a kind of genetic longevity increase? Um, Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think it does it does kind of come down to semantics because if you, you know go back 100 years then doing like hygiene measures yeah. would literally be considered a uh, longevity intervention some right? sort of so amazing maybe, maybe in, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maybe in 100 years time we'd look 
look back or they would look back and go okay <laughs> what they did then was just crazy like what we do now is just considered the norm yeah. um so it's why it's were you burning about- coal like it was insane <laughs> like what what on earth shining x-rays into people to see their bones what the hell was that all about so you, you've got to be careful right we're all we're all a, a product of our times Exactly. So I, yeah, so I think a lot to a large extent, it does come down to semantics. And obviously, we sort of, we know, like, based on model organisms that these interventions show promise, but mm. until we've done these large scale human clinical trials, we really, we don't know at the moment. So it's exciting times, because it seems like, uh, you know, these trials are literally like, on the edge waiting to be done. Um, mm. But yeah, it's too early to say. Um, but then if they don't work, then there's hundreds of other researchers now exploring a variety of different um compounds and mm. so it'll be interesting to to find out what else we discover anything on on the other one was resveratrol which i think is so people put out these these resveratrol, resveratrol supplements i think it's in in red wine i think you know there's always this sort of old wife's tale about you know if you have a, a nice glass of red wine every night you'll you know live to be 140 and all this sort of stuff What's uh, what any any thoughts on resveratrol? Yeah, so I mean resveratrol's yeah, fan of grapes, um, particularly like uh or red grapes. Mm. Um and so yeah, I mean, at the moment there's is still a lot of controversy about resveratrol. I mean, the one thing that I consider it is like a kind of like a dirty molecule, like a gem of mm. like metformin, but even more so resveratrol. Um it, we don't really know what it's doing in the cells. There mm. was initial talks that it was activating this protein called c one but there's been uh, evidence that disproves that theory as well um and so we didn't entirely know what myriad of impacts it might be having on a cell and then the other concern with resveratrol is the dose um and how that might influence the cell and so mm. yeah I, I to phrase it weirdly i'm less kind of bullish on yeah. anything like that um it might have some like but um improvements to like specific diseases but in terms of longevity itself it seems like there's probably better options out there being tested so it seems it seems like this um you know and it, it's not disappointing at all because this is the nature of science but it seems like there's there's still a lot we need to learn and we're just getting started in this testing a lot of these compounds trying to work out what these gene expressions what these pathways are that are important for longevity and uh there's a there's a lot more we need to learn basically and a lot of research that's currently going on is that is that a fair assessment of where we're at in the in the field that we've got a lot of ideas but there's still a lot we don't know yeah i would say so and i think yeah again as we kind of alluded to earlier i think part of that comes down to the fact that we still struggle to agree on what we consider aging yeah um and what the key kind of mechanisms to underpin it are and like so i think the basic research is important to the, like the fundamentals as to what aging is as well as like the more clinical applications of testing different uh, drugs or different interventions. So I think it's, yeah, it's an exciting time to to be here. Obviously, maybe you'd, maybe you'd want to be born 20 years later. I was but, just saying, yeah, I mean... you're so much luckier than me. Like if only my parents had held off for a little bit, I might have been, you know, in the Elysium that is, uh, you know, 20 years hence. So I'm just going to be that 70 year old guy that all the young, eternal youngsters look at and say, nobody looks like that anymore. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be awful. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think what the future might hold. Um, I mean, as like for my own interest, I'll say I'm quite young, but like I just find the whole because it's such a complex issue, I just find it fascinating as a kind of biochemical question as to understand yeah. um, our, our cells better. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I like that kind of aspect to it as hmm. well. That it is, it's interesting. You allude to, um, you know, a lot of research and some of the semantics about the research because I think. I think the WHO only in 2019 accepted that aging is a disease because I think I think the the definition of a disease is that it obviously it's debilitating but you couldn't get it in because it affects over 50% of people aging affecting every single person so there was potentially a little bit of skittishness about whether it was even a sort of debilitating condition or quote unquote disease um and if you can get it over that semantic line, there's probably more research, more funding that comes in with that. But again, that's that semantics and how people look at aging. Is it just something that happens that we can't deal with? Or can we ex- can we now start to accept that maybe there's something we can do about it? I guess you have to get over that line first before people start taking 
the research seriously and putting more time, more bodies into it. Exactly. And like you raised the important point that a lot of it comes down to good science communication. Mm. So I like to think I try and help out with that. Um, like I don't ever want to like be ultra promote something. I just yeah. want to, you know, state the evidence yeah. as it is yeah. when it comes in and tell you what we know, what we don't know, where we're currently investigating, what looks promising, you know, what's exciting. Mm. But like, I think, yeah, because obviously what you don't want to do is promote something that turns out to be disproven and like um that's why there's a lot of skepticism over the field and has like yeah. created hurdles in the past and so i guess being the kind of new generation of researcher then i you know i just want to try and you know provide the known evidence yeah. and let people use that to guide their own decisions um and yes to just try and educate people on what we know and then they can use that information how they want and i think you're certainly doing a great job because i mean i mean even with something as serious as covid we can see how you know people are not particularly trustful unfortunately of of you know certain communicators and certain institutions which is a great shame and it's it's important to get that to get that link back with people by being honest and and, and getting the the evidence out there is very very important as you say one one sort of final area I wanted to come into we talked a little bit about supplementation because obviously people are interested in you know what could I potentially take what might be the miracle cure that comes along again I'll say we're not suggesting to take anything you know these things are being studied potentially interesting but but you know don't go drinking five bottles of red wine a night or doing anything stupid we're not suggesting that at all another thing that people talk about with in in kind of longevity biohacking circles you know you've got people like joe rogan on this although i'm not saying take any medical advice from joe rogan do not um people talk about caloric restriction and intermittent fasting got any any thoughts on those sort of lifestyle choices sure so i mean yeah that, that's actually quite big topics really mm. so uh to start with i guess like caloric restriction um i believe that's the only intervention that um has been shown to provide longevity benefits in the majority of model organisms mm. um obviously we don't know for humans but like for most model organisms it seems to to uh yeah show enhancements and it kind of comes back again <clears throat> to this inhibition of this growth signaling pathway so it all kind of fits into the same narrative mm. um but the more uh, interesting, so I'll say caloric restriction has concerns, right? So um, it's like diet is a very complicated issue and also has like very much emotional and um, consequences as well. Like it's hard to... Um, if you're miserable and yeah. depressed because you haven't been eating all the time, you're going to you're gonna have worse health outcomes and feel worse and have a, a lower standard of living. It's, it's not just a, a magic bullet that you can... Oh, I'm not eating more, so I'm going to live longer. That's fantastic. Off we go. Exactly. And like, obviously, there's concerns of like um, wanting to be thinner, like going on diets and like uh, counting calories. And there's concerns with doing things like that. So like, as well as like the malnourishment and not being able to actually get everything that your body needs. Hmm. And so the kind of alternative idea to kind of circumvent that is to do things like intermittent fasting, hmm. where you can still eat the same amount of foods, but you just limit the time window on which you eat it. Hmm. And so the idea is you should in theory still be getting enough uh, nutrients for your body, but you give your body time to enter mildly or depending on how long your fasting state is, um, into the state of fasting, which again, kind of sh not effectively shuts off, but reduces signaling through these pathways and instead activates um, autophagy and processes that maybe help to promote cell cellular repair as, as opposed to cell growth. And so... So people, yeah, so people to... talk about skipping lunch, having breakfast and skipping lunch and having a late dinner. So you've got that that big window. And then after you've had that, you've got another big window to breakfast again when you're sleeping. So so sort of arranging your day so that there's there's these big gaps between when you're taking on food. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, the evidence is still coming through for that. Like, it'd be interesting to see larger human scale trials to mm. see really what happens. But um, I definitely think it's promising. And also, like, I think it's. I quite like the idea of it purely for the fact that it's just a lifestyle change. I mean, yeah. that's, I think it's just more of a societal thing, like accepting that it, we, for some reason, have accepted that we should have <laughs> breakfast, lunch and dinner. Why? Like, it's, why it's interesting, it? actually, because when I used to go into the lab, I used to go for lunch with everyone, even when I, I might have had a late breakfast, I wasn't hungry. But it's a, 
it was a, a social thing to go along. Oh, it's lunchtime now. So, okay, I've got to go for lunch. Or, or the other day, I remember we came back from, from Wales and I was like, we should get some dinner. Well, I'm not really that hungry. Yeah, but it's dinner time. There's, there's, there's a lot of social cues that we go, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be that way. Well, that's the thing. So there's, I think there's benefits. I think we're likely going to see from these larger scale trials that there are benefits to doing um, shorter time eating windows. But I'm curious more as to like the effects of the um, the social aspect. Mm. So if I want to do my intermittent fasting, maybe I have to sacrifice all this time I could be spending interacting <laughs> with friends over dinner. Like, cause yeah. you know, a lot of good conversations and stuff happen mm. during these times. Yeah. And so, yeah, it'd be interesting to see like, the concern to that. I guess the only solution really is to make everyone do the same thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're all gonna yeah. have this big feast once a day. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's obviously that's why you've got companies that make money out of you mm. having breakfast, buying dinner, and yeah, stuff like. Yeah. So, as I don't know really what's going to happen. Like maybe we'll have the evidence come out, and it won't. You know, I I, I don't know, but I think um, there seems to be evidence supporting that there could be benefits to doing intermittent fasting, and so. If that works for you, then yeah, it's good. I guess it. Um, I yeah, guess it's, it's like any of these things, right? If the, if if strong evidence starts to come out, it's not quite there yet, but if strong evidence starts to come out, people, are, you know, a certain set of early adopters will start taking it on. We start getting the evidence that they live a bit a little bit longer. They seem a little bit healthier in various diseases and such, and then more and more people start taking it on, and then suddenly a generation later, it's how did we ever not have this? How did we exactly. how, so? Yeah. You know, it doesn't get forced. It just sort of slowly permeates through society. And then, you know, when you look back 50 years later, it's uh, it's the new way of doing things. I guess that's how it's uh, how it's always been to some extent. Yeah, it's a good way of thinking about it. So I guess uh, we should we should wrap up because I know you've we've got about five minutes left and you need to you need to pop off. You've got a lot to do. Um as we wrap up, sort of how confident are you? And this is where I switch from being a, a scientist to a journalist or a speculator. How confident are you that we'll be able to sort of hugely increase the human uh, lifespan or human longevity? And h- how far do you think we can push it? And what are the timescales that these things might be coming down the track? And any any insight or or your just personal thoughts about these things being in the field and looking at these things um honestly i would have to be disappoint you and say it's honestly too early for me to really predict it i mean one thing that um i would like to to see as an outcome would be the kind of compression of multiple morbidities so mm. the idea of improving health span um as opposed to lifespan yeah. like i'd like to see people live healthier for longer yeah. and reduce the burden and the incidences of these different diseases because not only will that improve quality of life for many but will reduce the cost that's currently being spent on treating these different diseases mm. so yeah i as i don't know that's probably not what you wanted but that's that's how i no no it. no that's perfectly fine that's the scientist answer so that's completely fine they i i think this is something that people sometimes gets a little bit of a bad press because people get get they go, oh, I just want to get get it up to 120, get it up to 140, get it up to 160. But if if people aren't living healthily, then obviously that's, you know, who wants to live the age between 70 and 80 for you know 60, 70 years going on? It's it's not going to be a be a fun thing. So as you say, I think it's probably better to increase that that health span. And if people can live happily and and healthily, you know, who wouldn't want that? I think most of the time when people say, would you want to live to X? You just think, mm, well, I'm going to be falling apart, aren't I? Well, I t- when, when I'm at that age, so so why would I want to do that? So I think it's it's difficult, uh, it's uh, important to separate out those two things. Is yeah, that, definitely. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's wrap up then. So I've learned an awful lot. Thank you so much for for taking the time. I really really appreciate it. Um, where can people go to find out more about the research that you're doing? You've got an excellent channel where people can learn more about these specific topics. We've done a, a really nice overview there. But where would you where would you like people to go to to keep up with what Eleanor Shiki's doing today? Um, yeah, so obviously my YouTube channel is a good place. Um, I'm also mainly active on Twitter. Yep. Um, and I'd advise like just anyone who's got interest in science to generate a Twitter account if you don't already have one, just because it's just a good way to see the latest research. 
whether it's me trying to retweet stuff or from other <laughs> researchers. So yeah. Awesome. I will make sure all those links are down in the description. The the channel is up on the show uh, on the uh, on the screen as well. So everyone, head over there, have a listen, see what you think, leave a comment, get involved in that discussion. You won't be disappointed. Eleanor, thank you so much again for taking the time, and uh, hopefully we can chat again when something else interesting comes along in this field. Cool. Well, thank you for having me. I know it's great talking to you. An absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot. Bye now. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.